Now, if you were to try and explain what the Castanet Club was to anybody who never saw it or wasn't a part of it, it would be impossible. I always think the Castanet Club is a way of doing things. 12 people doing something different at the same time. It was a synergism. I read that on the back of a 12-inch of a 12 inch Frankie Goes to Hollywood once, where you have a whole bunch of things that on their own do something, but when you put them all together, it's a really big thing. It's like Burning Man on stage, meeting Glastonbury, meeting the Edinburgh Comedy Festival, and it's all exploding at the same time, and nobody knows what's happening, and the audience is just being fractured with bits of lightning coming off. So I'd never seen anything so funny, just so suburban, my perfect sense of humour, great observations, great songs. They're all funny, They're all funny people. Everyone in the band is, is still funny, when apart from Steve. So talented and so Australian and fluorescent and audiences love them. The whole venue was the personality of the group and there were all these strange creatures and I was, I was really impressed. It's wrong to think of them as a band. They were theatrical performers who could play the odd instrument. A lot of people had multi-skills. I mean, the wonderful thing about working with such great improvisers is that you would go on thinking something was going to happen. It never happened. Something amazing would happen, and that became the piece. It was like going into battle as a cabaret performer. There's somebody around the back making lamingtons, and there's somebody cutting hair, and this guy, Bowie Man, is dropping coins out his ass. There's a fat guy up the back in a smelly Elvis suit that Amy didn't want to be in the bus with. There's a diva on stage singing. They had this wonderful thing that we always wanted to have in the band, which was girls. Hugely talented, smart, sassy, super cool, self-possessed women. And then we've got the horn section that's kind of going off like a big band horn section and everything is bigger than it should be. I always think we were like a punk band. We could do anything we wanted to do, but instead of being bleak, we were excessively daggy. With a lot of the music from our childhood, the material was always anchored in that familiarity of popular culture and retro nostalgia. A lot of Vegas stuff in there. Well, it was a big band. And when you've got someone up the front like Lance Norton and Glenn Butcher, Glenn's got the pipes for a big show tune. We had the club, we had the band, we had the ancillary people. It was a whole group of people that came together that couldn't have worked anywhere else. If it had been in Sydney, there would have been too many distractions and the whole thing would have broken up before it got to critical mass. Well, I can't ever remember the Castanet Club having a bad gig. No one can say that. A big part of the story is what happened after the band finished. Almost half of them were still working in showbiz, which is unheard of. It sort of set the direction for the rest of my life. I've been working in show business because of what I did in the Castanet Club. Castanets are part of Australia's creative legacy, whether Australia wants it or not. It was a joyous, wonderful, exuberant, all-inclusive, larger than the sum of its parts experience. We were like the fizz on the top of a social scene. Newcastle University Drama Department, which is where I met people like John Doyle and Mikey Robbins, who I worked with at Triple J. Out of that sort of stew, the musical flags were formed. Oh, I can't stop. I'm getting into debt, so I'll write another check. Oh, I can't stop. Oh, so it was a theatrical band. It had stand-up and an unusual canon of songs. Well, Maynard wasn't in the band to begin with. He just kept turning up. He put his mic out the window at the Cambridge and he had to stand on the, on, on the footpath and play him through the window. Mark Jackson played trumpet. A mini hurricane called Barton Malcolm played bass. Jonathan Biggins, or Johnny played guitar. He was super dag. I walked into the Grand Hotel and the musical folks were playing. And within minutes, I was dancing on a pool table and thought, this, uh, these are my people. There was sweat coming down the walls. And this sense that the floor was about to give way. Well, the musical flags played for two years, broke up, and out of that rubble uh, came the Castanet Club. 
Well, we spent a lot of time in our lounge rooms entertaining each other and <laughs> making each other laugh. So the basic idea was to take that on stage and uh, charge people to see us do that. Steve Abbott and Pete Marnie had the idea of making an actual physical club and that kind of had a, a, a strange attractive me mechanism that attracted talent and like-minded people from as far as Sydney. Getting the club, well, that was fantastic. That just gave us a home every week. All those people just seemed to come together. Yeah, nobody had any money. Everyone just wanted to do stuff. What was our rent, like $15 <laughs> or something? In Newcastle, you kind of had it all. You could rehearse very cheaply. You could live cheaply. Easy to find a place to play. You could actually get paid for playing. You weren't going to get rich, but you would do better than the doll. And you, that meant you felt like you were a king. The Castanet ethos was have a go. And there were people doing stuff that, yeah, maybe you should have always had a go, but you had a go and a lot of it would stick. I was lucky enough to be invited to join them for one night. I played bass. Steve called us uh, Major Bumsaw and the Rough Riders. And you could have different kinds of night. It didn't always have to be a comedy night. We might have a dance night or little films and more unusual things. And we started getting the acts from Sydney, which were big draw cards as well. When Ostentatious played the Castanet Club, he was having a go too. Australiana wasn't fully formed at that stage. Because it looked pretty wholesome to me. It was all very, on the surface, really light and really friendly. But there was a kind of an underbelly there. Johnny Goodman comes on and does a song called My Parents Will Be Dead Soon. And I thought, oh, I love these people. And I was in from then on. I just thought this is the best group I'd ever seen. We had so much interaction with the audience that they were really part of the club. One of our core philosophies is no gap between us and the audience. It was just an explosion of goodwill from the audience because we had no fourth wall. We related directly to the audience. We were sort of, a, I suppose, a society of friends, like the Quakers. We were entertaining and working with people long before the lights came up and the mics properly came on make lamingtons and serve them to people in the audience. Which sounds like a sort of, oh, they're just being nostalgic, but actually we are doing that to buy a rehearsal sound system. Warren used to have this character called Dr. Rudy Zempf who would do psychoanalysis. <laughs> Maynard and I would run around with a, a Polaroid and you could have your photo taken with Elvis, which I would sign. We probably owe the um, Elvis estate a fortune over that. The great thing is, once you actually make friends with the audience, it becomes harder for people to dislike you. If they've already made friends with you, they think, oh, no, there I am, Eddie Merlin, it's very nice, you know? It was a very loyal bunch of people that would come to those gigs. Those queues outside the club and people would always try to sneak in. Alison on the door would sort of take their watches and say, well, you can go and find your friends, but you better come back or I'm keeping the watch. Like, it was all that sort of thing. You must be the people who are interested in finding out about the Castanet Club. Well, here they are. The characters that everyone played in the band were all, to a greater or lesser extent, just extensions of themselves. Warren invented Bowling Man, so he could be on stage with us, because he didn't play an instrument. Warren always thought he was an alien. He truly grew up thinking he was an alien. Warren turned up as a friend of Angela's because they went to NIDA together. I mean, he was young and gorgeous and funny and intelligent and truly amazing. This is in 1982 and he was using hip-hop. He was years ahead of his time. That's Ten Pin bowling. Not Mark bowling, cos he's dead. He had a car crash. He had a car crash and he went into a tree. Modelled a lot of his locutions and rhythms on my no longer with his deaf cousin. He was a very literate and very smart guy, but he had unusual ways of saying things. If I hook into it, that would help me get to how the character saw the world. Mikey was Elvis Prezel. <laughs> Because, weirdly enough, Mikey looked a bit like Elvis Presley in the latter years and the early years because he, he had the really kind of handsome Elvis face with the, well, let's say the girth of Elvis in the latter years. Sorry, Mikey, I really I hated saying that, but I kind of loved it as well. And I could play Love Me Tender with a recorder up my nose. The idea was that Elvis wasn't dead, he was alive, he was living in Newcastle and doing kids' parties. It's not a high point in Australian theatrical history. <laughs> Maynard just looked like, well, he should be studied. And that was Maynard's act. It was like he just had a line of speed and danced into a wall. Like he was having some sort of fit, like a medical condition, I think, more than a performance. Anyway, Ange was like a surf chick because when she was young, Ange was a surf chick. Ange always looked like she just walked off the set from Bewitched. She was stunning. And then Shirley, of course, was a whole nother thing, totally based it on my grandmother. Shirley can't give a compliment even when she tries. It would always come out as a backhander. It would always get huge laughs. A lovely beard, he's like me. I found something in the 70s and I stuck to it and so did he. Look at that. Her family 
of course, Barry, played by Steve, and Darren, played by Glenn. It was a rather large 12-year-old. <laughs> Shirley kind of took off for me because she was a feminist without knowing it, I think. I managed to tour over to America with some other comedians for that. She took me quite far, Shirley, from the suburbs of Yowie Bay. The Wet Stubbies competition was probably my most memorable piece by making the men wear the stubby shorts and spraying them and seeing who was best. <laughs> Isn't it? Katrina with a bit of tender loving care and watch them grow. That's the way. Not bad. I'm not sure the American market was ready for that. Glenn Butcher, who is also a very warm and generous and giving person, as Lance was always self centered and narcissistic. You would never be outright nasty. It would always seem as if it were wrapped in velvet, but there was a nasty fist inside. Shani Goodman, what a mundane childhood. It was just a bit of defence. I think I wore sunglasses the first few gigs because I was terrified. Well, they're all extensions of, you know, your personality. Steve Abbott was uh, Johnny Goodman. That character became Sandman, and I think he was Mr Funny in another thing. But Steve always played that sad clown deadpan. Sandman is basically an impression of Steve's mother, Evelyn, is now no longer with us. And I see that part of him and how that dialogue still takes place between him and that character on stage. And a very formal approach to comedy, he would outline what he was going to do. He would say, well, for example, I'm going to do three hard years and then a song. It was fabulous. Some people were themselves. Like Barton Malcolm Fox was incapable of playing a character. Rodney Cambridge, the drummer. Uh, Rodney Cambridge, NBE. Erman Ernst Weil, of course, a killer bass player. Carlo Thrillhammer, I think that speaks for itself. <laughs> Russell looked like he just walked off a film noir set in the 50s. From the Lecoq school of uh, clowning. If you want some mime done, here's your guy. You can buy it in bulk from Russell, miming. Still sing their songs like um, Russell's roadie character. What was it? I got hit with the ugly stick. Got it hurt. Um. <laughs> I was just driving along Industrial Drive. No one walks along Industrial Drive. He was this guy, tight blue pants and Ugg boots, and he had long black hair and a flannel shirt. I thought, I can make something out of this. I was Natasha Bassey, songbird from the Eastern Bloc, because I never spoke. Doris Crawley, Penny, a sexual dynamo. She made that up. Uh, well, maybe well, she wasn't making it up, I don't know. Kath Bluff played violin. It wasn't just the inner sanctum of who was on stage, there were so many other people surrounding the band that were part of the whole thing. The Castanets Club wouldn't have kept going as far as they did without Jodie. She was the linchpin. I had to become a bit of an expert in every single facet of the band's presentation, really. Painting, printmaking, t-shirt making, designing. We had wonderful artists like Therese Kenyon, Stephen Clark. But everyone had that idea of how the Castanet Club might look. Stephen Clark with our posters and Michael Bell with our posters. The whole look of the Castanet Club sign, Michael Bell stuff was amazing. In those days, it was all DIY. You know, Jody or Steve said, do you want to make a sign? You know, it happened within about a, a week, I think. Each letter was cut out of the top of a school desk. The sign cost nothing to make at all. The colour scheme came from a pack of licorice all sorts. And I guess I'm, I'm referencing old Luna Park, a bit of old Las Vegas sort of club look, kitschy TV shows at the time. And then later I worked with him on the Sandman stuff and he made a, a t-shirt that sold an obscene amount. It was the biggest seller at the big day out. It was out selling bananas in pyjamas. Oddly, we took it very seriously. We put a hell of a lot of rehearsal time in and a lot of time thinking about what we were doing. It was completely consuming. It was every day we were in each other's lounge rooms or kitchens, scheming, coming up with ideas, talking about the next set of gigs, brainstorming new shows, talking about tours, talking about how to raise money. Your life was this incredible group. In the period between, I guess, November 82 and September 83, we did four complete shows. Some of them had all new music, all live music, all written basically by us. We did our first bus show in November, December 82. Then we did a live radio show from the club in early 83. We did uh, Back to Front Room in mid 83 and Mission Molly Morgan the same year for the Hunter Valley Theatre Company. The Castanets were all about like trying to do that bit extra. We take audiences to places you're not supposed to go. We basically pretended a bus was an aeroplane and we took people around Newcastle and pretended we were going on a trip around the world. So it was like mobile street theatre. It went so well in Newcastle we did it with two double-decker buses in Sydney. 
you wouldn't be able to do it now. You couldn't pay the insurance. As Steve said to me, yeah, someone could have been killed on that. We're taking audiences out who have been drinking, getting them on and off buses in traffic. I'd raise her head and set up all the odd things. I think I was attacked by a gorilla outside the Double Bay Cinemas. There was a house on the corner of the park and it looked like a big iceberg, so we were showing slides on that person's house. And then on one particular occasion, like this guy comes out with a tomahawk. And, like, he's absolutely furious and he's waving the tomahawk around. And then we got all our audience there. So we, we had to run, run for it back to the bus, you know, and ring the cops. But we kept going back and showing the slides on his house every week and the same thing kept happening. So it became part of the show. We gave them an experience they'd never had before. And it was kind of what we were about is we always wanted to over connect with our audiences. So. The bus show was an extreme version of that. When we did the radio show, we rehearsed and wrote a whole bunch of new material, but that was all created over several weeks, rehearsed and then performed live to air one night in the club. The opening night was also the closing night and the complete season. Back to Front Room, I think I'm right in saying was next, which was at the club, but was a theatrical show that Michael Bell designed sets for. It was a house and everyone dressed up as furniture and then three characters came in and it was like a bad trip, this thing. I did appear naked in it very briefly as a lawnmower. Full frontal, shaking it about as hard as he could. Why he was the lawnmower, I'm not quite sure. And that was also the set that um, hosted Tiny Tim. How could it be that this guy that I'd watched on Laughing in 1968 was now, you know, on stage and I was introducing him? We were the backing band. He was just yelling out keys he was playing in and they were wrong and we didn't know any of the songs. I stood outside for a while and I thought, I just can't even watch this train wreck. Tiny is like a living jukebox. He knows a million of these tunes. Played rock around the clock and we kind of knew the song. And for two minutes, like Tiny, he just came alive. Like he was magic. The light gleamed an instant and then it was night once more, <laughs> as Samuel Beckett once said. He went back to the other stuff and that we couldn't play and it was a train wreck again. I put that down as one of the strangest nights in our 10 years of existence. Then going from that to the Hunter Valley Theatre Company to do Mission Molly Morgan, which had been written by Pete Matheson, which was a real play, but we sort of inhabited it and all our original music. Most theatre shows take Monday nights off and that's the night the club was on, so we could play seven nights a week. Well, we played the beer barns here too, you know, the Palais, the Ambassador, the Shortland Hotel, Rosebuds, Belmont 16 Footers, the Mawson and the club was different, always different every week. So we were continually performing. And what that gave us in the end was we had a show that could work in a pub, but it could also work in the end a year later at Belvoir Street. And by the end of that period, the end of 83, having spent like a year creating and performing shows, it was kind of right time for us then to go to Adelaide in 84 to the festival because we were ready. We couldn't have planned it better. We took a three hour show to like a fringe festival. Like a three hour show, we didn't cut anything. It was madness to do that. And people just went ape shit. It was like we were the Beatles. They were the, the kings and queens of the festival at that time. It really felt like you were playing Shea Stadium every night in that big old warehouse in Adelaide and people just went crazy. Then for that to lead to a season in Melbourne. The first time I saw them on stage at the last laugh, when Glenn Butcher started singing, I was just in love. Just the biggest spunk ever. Those cabaret days were so good. The last laugh was just the place to be. And a season in Edinburgh, the Edinburgh Fringe. Jody kept us all together and found those gigs for us that took us to be quite successful and to go to the Edinburgh Festival. Performing in the midnight time slot at the Edinburgh Festival, and you think, oh, that's a bad time slot, was actually, it was a great time slot to get. It was packed. We sold out, uh, got great reviews. Someone described it as 12 people playing tennis, all of them serving at once, and I think that's, <laughs> that was kind of us. We were fairly relentless. Got offered gigs in France and Ireland. And People just didn't want to hang around, they wanted to get back to Newcastle, so we never did the London season. I, I wonder what would have happened if we had. Guy who's serious was one of the people who'd come to see us as a group as well, and he was at that stage planning the early stages of Young Einstein, and originally he'd made a 20 minute short. We were all in that. On the basis of that short got the deal to make a feature, and then he asked us to be in that as well. Although we never wrote anything in the picture, we did do a lot of work to create the performances of the characters that we played. And in 1990, the band got to make the film at the North Bondi RSL oh, with a whole heap of talented people. It really is the Castanet Club at the peak after nine years of performing, it encapsulates the talent and the experience in one movie.
the group had a lot of momentum all through the 80s and I guess that sort of started to peter out from around about 1990 as people maybe looked to um, explore some different projects. That was when things kind of drifted apart. When the band finished, it was very deep sense of loss. I wanted the band to go on forever. For me, it was like someone was vacuuming and another person came and pulled the plug out of the wall. And that was the sound of, of my heart sinking when the band broke up. If you look at all the members of the Castanet Club, as late as into the 2000s, almost half of them were still working in showbiz, which is unheard of for show people generally, and show people from Newcastle particularly. Maynard, of course, went on to work at Triple J for the longest time on Breakfast and then in television as a VJ and whatever it is that Maynard is. I left the band on New Year's Eve 88, 89. That was a very interesting night because I played with the Castanet Club, then I hosted Rage live from the showground rat party to doing my breakfast show on Triple J from that showground at 6 a.m. that morning. It was almost my entire career in 12 hours there describing what was going on. Then Mikey, of course, took up the torch from Maynard at Triple J Breakfast Radio. Then teamed up with Razor for the breakfast show at Triple J and then he got his old mate Steve-O. Uh, I got Steve-O, a little gig, doing the Sandman on Triple J. I got a job with Mikey. Oh, he's had a number of TV shows. He's worked with Steve and Tony Squires. He's worked on television extensively. Also, he's an author these days, and he's written a number of books. As always, they're just like Mikey. They're compact and funny. Steve, of course, has done a great many things since the Castanets. The really big breakthrough for him was once he started working on Mikey's Breakfast Show on Triple J as a Sandman, and that spawned seven books, a number of CDs, his own Johnny Goodman show band album, The Fat and Good Newsweek, and his own TV specials with Paul Livingston, with whom he still performs. For 20 odd years and still to this day, we're still touring together, and Steve just loves to complain about everything. So for a quarter of a century, we've both hated what we do together and done really well. Ange did Play School, became a really popular, really beloved Play School presenter. Seemed to me a natural progression. And now that I'm writing for Play School, I always like to bring some humour into my scripts. It keeps it light and kids love it. Warren has an amazing brain. I feel like, you know, he could set his hand to anything. I ended up writing a little bit for the theatre and then I started directing in the theatre. He went into the whirlpool of George Miller and he co-wrote and co-directed Happy Feet 1 and then he co-wrote Happy Feet 2. And the first film ended up winning the uh, Oscar for Best Animated Feature of 2007, which uh, still, frankly, is something it's, I find hard to believe. Out of all the Castanets, Jody has flown the highest for the longest. In London now, running an agency and manages Steve McQueen of 12 Years a Slave. Penny did her own radio show at the ABC in, in Sydney. I did a few mainstream shows with the Sydney Theatre Company. I was in wonderful casts and great shows with great directors like Barry Kosky and Neil Armfield. Post Castanet Club, he won Sale of the Century. It's true that the Castanets have not one but two Sale of the Century winners. In 1991, I did Sale of the Century and took away a bunch of money and a couple of cars. I left as soon as I won the cars and Russ decided that if he was in the same position, he would go right through to the end and he proved it by doing exactly that a year later. You had to win eight shows in a row and I won and I had almost enough money to buy my apartment at Bondi Beach. It created my life, really. The circus came along and I joined it. And you just do the next thing and then the next thing. I met Gina Riley very early in her career. Through her, I got a call about coming down and maybe being part of a changeover from fast forward to full frontal. And then when they did turn over, I became part of that cast. And then you end up in Kath and Kim in little tiny bit parts with that. And then in full frontal, I met Kitty Flanagan. She's just made a sitcom, which I appear in as an actor. So it's just that like-minded folk thing. You really just find your people. You find your tribe. and. Um, and you're stuck with them. <laughs> it gave me the circle of friends, most of whom I've stayed in touch with and are very close friends now. Everyone's lives creatively just kept flowing in and out, I think, as well as socially. You know, I met Andrew, who I got married to, and I became a parent. We had our child together, Max. That took us in a whole nother direction. I met Therese at the start of the Castanets, and 40 years later, we're still together. Over the years, you know, Rodney and I spent a lot of time together and we ended up going out together. We've been happily partners now, I think it's 30 years. It's shaped my life a lot. It's given me everything, really. What you saw on stage was a bunch of really nice people, and they still are. I mean, apart from Steve. You should get back together and do one of those sort of Beach Boys tours, old people tours of regional Australia. 
We were part of an event that was much bigger than ourselves. Everything we did was for our audience. I think it's a little kernel of our life that will stay with us, you know, for the rest of our lives. And as Jody Shields says, being manager of the Castanet Club was the thing that she's most proud of in her life. And I can see exactly why she says that. I feel honoured and blessed in my life to have been part of it because it felt like a family. We were a family. We invited the audience to be part of our family. It had that whole feel and it was incredibly unique. Anyway, I'll stop now. But God bless each and every one of them. I work with a lot of people in my life. A lot of very, very, very talented people. Steve's the only one who comes close to being a genius. When Steve's on that, in that zone, he'll say something and you just go, where the fuck did that come from? This feels like it's our funeral though. This feels like I'm at my own funeral. So thanks for the opportunity to speak at my funeral. <laughs>